is Kevin Kanaan. I'm the president of the club. And so I just wanted to welcome you to our first meeting of 2021. And uh, for tonight's uh, program, uh, we are going to be uh, talking about telescopes. You know, lately, a lot of people have been buying telescopes, people are spending more time at, at home, and uh, they've been putting some of that spare time to good use, and they've been buying telescopes and other types of astronomy gadgets. And uh, so we thought it'd be really good to kick off our uh, first meeting of the year with a basic introduction to how to uh, use a telescope. Uh, and so we'll cover some of the basics uh, during this uh, particular program. Uh, Mark Zdarsky, uh, our chair of the uh, observation committee, will be uh, taking the lead on this. And uh, for the introduction, he'll be talking about the equipment. Uh, I'll be talking about what you can see in the sky. And then uh, Mary Lou West uh, will be uh, talking a little bit uh, about the moon, uh, is, which is a very common object for beginners. And so uh, I think we should uh, get started here. Uh, Mark, if you want to um, start sharing your screen and we'll sure. get started with our presentation all about uh, an introduction to telescopes. Okay. Okay, let's see if I can get this to at the right size. And <clears throat> okay. Can everyone see it fine? It looks that looks good. So uh, our uh, January meeting is titled, So You Have a New Telescope, Now What? How do you use it? Or how do I use it? Um, lately with uh, the coronavirus, um, there have been uh, explosive, part, certain parts of the economy have uh, faltered while other parts of the economy have uh, kind of exploded. <clears throat> and one of them is astronomy equipment it's because one of the things people can do uh, socially distanced and, you know, things you can do in your own backyard or maybe travel, you know, go camping somewhere and take your telescope with you. <clears throat> So most of uh, the astronomy stores and outlets have had extremely high demand. Uh, and one of the thing, biggest Christmas gifts this year was um, astronomy equipment, telescopes, cameras, all that sort of thing. Uh, we're just gonna you know, deal with the basics because a lot of folks, <clears throat> they'll buy a telescope and they'll get in over their head or they're kind of unsure how it works. Uh, is it pointed right? You know, um, there's a lot of different questions that you see. Uh, so we'll deal with uh, quite a few of the, the basics. And if there are any questions, feel free to uh, ask in the chat room uh, and uh, it'll be brought up. So <clears throat> which telescope is right for you? Um, and that is, um, that is a question that um, there is no one right answer. Um, there are many different types of telescopes. Um, yes, they all can do the same thing as far as looking through an eyepiece, at least most of them. Uh, but some do certain things better than others. Uh, and I'll get into some of that um, at this moment now. <clears throat> so we'll cover the three basic, you know, types of telescopes that you see uh, the amateurs use uh, most commonly. Um, we'll start mostly with, with the refractor, which is the most common type of telescope. When people think of a telescope, uh, that's what the immediate what they think of as, you know, a long tube with the lens and an eyepiece uh, out, the, out the back, uh, hopefully not uh, on, the, on the deck of a pirate ship, but uh, <laughs> that's what most folks uh, think they come to, comes to mind. Um, a reflector, um, which is um, most of the time is a Newtonian design, which is uh, Isaac Newton's creation. Um, but uh, perhaps what you see in today's day and age is the Dobsonian, which is a Newtonian on a uh, rocker box type of mount. Uh, it's made it uh, much more affordable. And uh, a compound or a Cassegrain uh, type of telescope, which is a, uses a combination of lenses and mirrors. And there are, uh, again, 
pros and cons to um, different types of telescopes. Um, you can see some pictures here. Uh, this is a refractor uh, up in the upper right is a small Dobsonian, like the one that's, um, you know, table mounted, and that might be good for a small child. Uh, and then in the lower right is a Schmidt Cassegrain or example of a Schmidt Cassegrain, which is a, you know, one of the most compound, uh, most common compound telescopes. So there are uh, advantages and disadvantages to each type. Uh, the refractors, uh, particularly, um, there are two types to get into it. Uh, archromats and aprochromats. Uh, the archromats are much uh, less expensive. Uh, they use less expensive glass. And, and so again, a refractor bends light. Uh, so an archromat doesn't quite bend all the, the spectrum perfectly. So you get some fringing around bright objects. Good for an introductory telescope, but uh, the aprochromats have the better color correction, uh, but they get expensive. It is also the type of telescope most um, astrophotographers uh, work with. Um, so these guys, the refractors have the highest cost uh, per inch of aperture. Aperture is basically the size of the objective or the primary mirror. Um, so uh, it often requires a, you know, a pretty beefy mount if you're going to um, do photography with it. Uh, but the, the good part about these telescopes in the smallest versions, if you get an inexpensive refractor, they have very good cool down time. Uh, and what is cool down time? Cool down time is the time the objective of the telescope uh, and the optics, uh, the whole optical train takes to get to uh, ambient temperature. So if I were to bring uh, one of the telescopes, you can't see in the small box, behind me outside right now, you know, it's a nice, you know, balmy 68, 72 degrees in my, in my office, but outside it's 32. So if I try to go look at Mars right now, I'll, it looks like I'll be looking at it underwater. Uh, the good thing about a small telescope like a refractor is just they cool down rather quickly and you can start doing some good observing with them uh, relatively uh, in a short period of time. <clears throat> Reflecting telescopes, um, and perhaps I think visually this is my favorite type of telescope for me. Um, they are what, you know, they give the most, uh, the most for the amount of money spent per unit of aperture. In other words, you can spend the least amount of money for a very big telescope compared to the other styles. Um, they're relatively simple design. They're easier to make. Um, you can view at the top of the tube uh, because of the, the way the optical train is. So uh, the mount does not have to be very high. Um, and uh, basically, you know, some of the, the bad parts is, you know, they, you need to align the optics uh, more often than other designs. So you, you, it's called collimation. So you line the mirror and that takes anywhere from two to five minutes. It's not very, you know, once you get used to it, it's not too bad. Um, and it's often um, probably the biggest and bulkiest style of the three telescopes. Um, so, I mean, you do get a cost benefit, but you also have a weight penalty. So uh, the final one I'll talk about is uh, the compound telescope or Cassegrain, Maksuto Cassegrain, Schmidt Cassegrains. They're all, uh, they, they're combinations of lenses and mirrors. <clears throat> the, probably the best part about these telescopes is that they can pack more aperture in a smaller tube. Um, you don't have that very large bulky, you know, apparatus of a telescope, um, you know, if, if, for instance, if you look at an eight inch reflector versus an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain, which is in the picture here, uh, the eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain is uh, maybe 15 inches in length where the, new, the Newtonian could be four feet or more uh, in length for the same size aperture. Um, that makes it more transportable uh, it's uh, also pretty easy to put it on a mount. Um, they also do everything very well. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, they're kind of the jack of all trades. They can do astrophotography. 
uh, maybe not better than a refractor can uh, as far as image clarity. Um, they can uh, they can be pretty large, anywhere from you know four inches to 14, 16, 18 inches. Uh, they make them. Um, and um, uh, the optics, they, they need collimation, but they don't need to be collimated uh, as often as uh, a Newtonian reflector. They seem to hold their alignment, uh, unless you really, you really jostle them, um, in which case then you do have to do the alignment. Um, um, the tube is sealed. Um, there's a piece of glass, which is a, a corrector of sorts, uh, but that also protects the mirrors from the outside elements. Um, so that's another plus of this type of telescope. Um, again, um, you know, they can be bulky once they get over a certain size. And, and, and even with reflectors and, and, and um, Cassegrains both, uh, the, if for an adult, I would recommend as a starting telescope, something in the eight inch aperture range. And the reason why I say that is pretty much anything smaller, your deep sky objects are not going to be um, very discernible except the very, very bright ones. Um, an eight inch telescope will give you enough aperture to start to introduce you to the brighter deep sky objects, but enough uh, portability so it just doesn't sit up in the corner or in a closet collecting dust uh, one of the worst things, you know, folks do is they buy something too large uh, and then they realize, oh, I have to go pick this thing up and assemble it and bring it outside. And, and it kind of becomes a deterrent. Um, so eight inches is a really nice aperture for folks to start with um, because it'll, it'll keep people interested in the hobby. Uh, yet at the same time, it won't be this uh, beast of burden to carry it out and transport it. Uh, also, sometimes, sometimes refer sometimes referred to as a boat anchor. <laughs> right, <laughs> it really weighs you down. It can be, it can be, yeah. Uh, especially um, certain telescopes, like a, a you know a big big Dobsonian. Um, some folks have them on wheels, uh, and then it's tr transport them to a dark sky site becomes an ordeal. Um, I even know a couple of folks that have them a tra have them in trailers. So I mean, they they can get large. Um, but uh, if you live, let's say you live in, in the city and you have to go to the country and do some camping or whatnot, an eight inch is a perfect size to start with. Uh, for a youngster, maybe one of those, uh, you know, four and a half inch, you know, tabletop Dobsonians, uh, that's a great way to get them introduced in the hobby. It's not too large. It's not too bulky. It'll show them the moon and bright planets very well. Uh, so that, that type of telescope is, is excellent for, for a youngster. Um, a small refractor is, you know, as a visual instrument, that will give in, in, introductory views to uh, the planets, but they're good for, you know, large star clusters and things of that nature. Um, again, the only thing with that, again, you keep getting smaller and smaller in aperture. Um, you know, it's more portable, but you see less. Uh, with a bright object like the moon, um, that's, that's not a problem. The moon is so bright. You don't need a, a large telescope to see detail. <clears throat> so again, this is just a, a quick schematic. It's, you know, the light path, how do they work? Uh, a refractor just is exactly that. It bends light. It goes to a series of, uh, you know, glass. Uh, some of it's stuck to each other. Some, sometimes they're separate pieces of glass, but it bends the light, brings it down to the diagonal. Uh, it bounces off the diagonal and usually gives you a image reversed uh, type of look with a star diagonal. Uh, I will say they do sell prism diagonals. They're usually 45 degrees and not 90. If you want to do terrestrial viewing with a refractor or a small compound telescope, that's fine. Um, they also, the only bad thing about those is they don't transmit as much light as the star diagonal. The star diagonal is a little better at that. Um, uh, Newtonian uh, essentially is pretty much all mirrors except for the glass for the eyepiece. The, the, um, the, the light comes into the front of the tube, bounces off the primary mirror, then bounces to the secondary mirror, uh, and then gives you an image reverse view through the eyepiece. Your uh, Schmidt-Cassegrain will go through a uh, spherical corrector lens 
in the beginning. Uh, it'll come out and bounce off the primary, uh, and then bounce on, off the secondary, then all the way back through the diagonal and and up and out through the um, the eyepiece. So there's a it's also known as a folded telescope. So the light bounces back and forth multiple times. And this is a, a generalization. Whoop, let me go back here. Uh, <clears throat> of the three types of or two types of equatorial masses. In reality, it's two, but they're showing three. There's a uh, a tripod mounted alt, alt as, which stands for altitude, which is up and down and azimuth, which is, you know, the horizontal axis. Um, so you're, it's simple up, down, right, left motions. Um, a Dobsonian mount is a rocker box, is essentially the same type of concept. Uh, the azimuth is again, um, the horizontal axis and the altitude uh, goes up and down. Now the negative part about those, uh, especially if they're manual, they don't track the sky at all. Um, they do make, you know, go-to telescopes that track the sky in this manner, and I'll get into that in a in a minute or two. Uh, but by far, um, the best type of mount for this sort of thing, you know, if you want to track objects, is an equatorial mount. An equatorial mount goes in two motions: uh, right ascension and declination. Uh, right ascension is essentially when the you know the, the object you're looking at is rising from the horizon in the east and sets in the west. Uh, the deck is just the perpendicular axis to that. Um, the mount itself is pointed towards the north star or Polaris and, and our uh, in our uh, northern hemisphere. So all you have to do then is once you've lined your object up. All you have to do is just turn one axis uh, to follow the object. It makes it much easier to track. The initial setup, however, is more complex than the former. Uh, so if you look on the right here, you can see your, uh, your equatorial mount and your mount, there's usually a little, a little uh, finder scope in the middle of the mount and it gets pointed directly towards Polaris or very close to it rather. Uh, and then everything from there will rise in the east and, and set in the west. Uh, everything that is that is either directly east and west of the mount, everything to the north of the mount is actually circumpolar for the most part. Uh, it neither rises or sets, and you can see that by the star trail. Uh, there's a long exposure, you know, uh, photograph where someone took the shutter of a camera and kept it open for a couple of hours. And you can see how the stars have moved around Polaris. Um, <clears throat> we are at, at latitude uh, about 40, 40.5 north. <clears throat> and so when we sight that, the North Star uh, is about 40 degrees above the horizon. So from our standpoint, everything we look at here uh, in this northern quadrant does exactly this. It rotates around Polaris from our, <clears throat> from our viewpoint. Everything from here, uh, from, you know, uh, from the east and west rather, and, and all the way to the south and behind the telescope will rise and set. So uh, going back to before about, we were talking about diagonals and, and you know, image orientation. When you're looking at something naked eye or perhaps through binoculars, um, you'll see your object in its correct view. For instance, the Pleiades here. I've always imagined it looks like a, a, a little ladle or a little dipper or a shopping cart. Um, but oftentimes when you look at it uh, through your telescope, it will not look that way unless you have a prism diagonal what we said we were talking about earlier. Um, if you have a uh, Newtonian reflector, it'll look like this, upside down and inverted. Uh, if you have one of these other two telescopes, the Cassegrain or, or a refractor, and they have a standard mirror star diagonal, uh, you'll, you'll get a mirror image view. And uh, mostly what most astronomers say, there's no up or down or right or left in space, so to speak. Um, so we really don't worry about that so much. Um, you know, it just take it may take a little time.
for someone to, you know, get flipped out in their head that right is left, or left is right or up is down. But once you get the hang of it, um, it, it, it uh, becomes second nature, like riding a bicycle. <clears throat> Finder scopes. Now, this is something uh, I have beef with, with most uh, telescope manufacturers, not all. <clears throat> a lot of times they love to include, if you look down the lower left here, a very cheaply made plastic red dot finder. And what it does is it, it projects, it's zero power. It projects a little dot and you line up the little dot with the object you're looking at in the sky. And hopefully that'll be lined up with your telescope. But more often than not, if it's not broken already when you first get the telescope, within two or three months, um, these two knobs, these adjuster knobs, they're made of plastic and they'll wear out. So they'll lose their alignment and you won't be able to get it realigned or the darn thing will just fall apart on you. Um, so more often than not, these, these are made cheaply uh, and they don't do that great a job. Uh, so one of the things I tell people right away is to take that, uh, well, order the new parts first, but then throw it in the garbage as soon as you get the new parts. Um, what I like to tell people to get is something uh, called a Telrad. Um, some of us swear by them. I'm one of those people. Uh, another uh, one I like to use is a either a right angle finder or straight finder, whichever you like better. In conjunction, um, they make a great team. Um, and particularly when you're starting out, this helps you learn the night sky. Um, a Telrad, if you look over here where the arrow is pointed, you'll get uh, four degrees, a, a circle, two degrees, and half a degree. And you really want to, you know, line up the object so it's in that little tiny circle. Um, there's another version called the Rigel Quick Finder. It doesn't, it only has a two degree circle and then the tiny one, uh, half degree there, but it's much lighter weight and smaller than a Telrad. So if you have a tiny telescope, you know, uh, the Rigel might be the answer, but if you have a, a bigger telescope, a Schmidt Cassegrain, eight inches or bigger, or um, or a Dobsonian, um, then you know, uh, then you know, get a Telrad and a uh, nine by fifty finder in conjunction. So what that will allow you to do is the this gives you a zero power, but the you know full view of the sky. Uh, a eight or nine by fifty finder will magnify eight or nine times. So if the object you're looking at is a little bit fainter, uh, you'll get to see it. And, and that will help, help you refine your search. And by the time you've aligned, you know, got it in the center of this finder scope, it should be in your eyepiece. And, and it makes it much easier uh, to find your object. <clears throat> so one of the other things you wanna do is make sure you align your finder scope when you first set up your telescope. Now that'll it, you go out in the daytime. You know, you take your Telrad and your um, and your finder, and you you uh, you know you find a distant object. Uh, you set up the telescope. You know, it could be a, a telephone pole, a stop sign, a, a chimney from some house very far down the street. You know, a hundred yards or so is probably a good indication or thereabouts. And uh, first you wanna get the lowest power eyepiece, the one with the biggest number, stick that in your telescope, uh, line up the main telescope. So you're gonna do the exact opposite what you do in the night sky. You wanna line up the main telescope on that far away object. And then make sure, you know, make sure this telescope is sturdy and you know, the object is in the center of that field. It's not gonna move. Um, and then you line up your finder scopes to your main eyepiece. And once you do those two things, um, every time you look in the finder scope, uh, it should be in the low power eyepiece. So basically, you know, uh, with the Telrad, I will go back one screen. Uh, there are three adjustment screws in the back. With uh, a, your unit power, uh, night by 50 finder, there's two screws here. To, to adjust the two axes. And so once you do that, uh, you're pretty much all set. It's best again to do that in the daytime. Uh, so then um, once you've aligned something in the Telrad, as you can see here, 
it will be in the eyepiece. Um, same again here. Uh, I There is a video I have here. I will share that later, both on uh, our NJAC IO group and our Facebook page of the process of someone uh, aligning a telescope. Basically, just what I just described, you can actually see it happen. Uh, I'll go very, very briefly into eyepieces. Um, so usually when you buy a new telescope, it comes with, you know, maybe two eyepieces, sometimes three. Um, use your uh, lowest power to find an object. Uh, numerically higher, uh, it's usually, you know, uh, in millimeters, you know, let's say you have your 30 millimeter eyepiece, that becomes your finder eyepiece. But it's also, it gives you the widest field of view. So some objects like big star clusters will fit nice into that wide, you know, that, that bigger, that lower power eyepiece. Um, when you're looking at planets, you will want to use a higher power, but not right away. You use your your low power to center the object first, just the same way you centered the object in the finder scope and then went to the low power eyepiece. Oh. You'll use the low power eyepiece to center the object and then incrementally go higher and higher in power. Um, you know, when you, uh, if your telescope only comes with one eyepiece or you want to get better eyepieces, um, what I usually tell people is get yourself a, a low power eyepiece first and maybe a middle power eyepiece, uh, and then a 2X Barlow. And the Barlow essentially is uh, you stick the eyepiece into the Barlow and say, let's you pick the 14 millimeter here. You stick it into the 2X, it becomes a seven millimeter. Um, so if you had something that was uh, 150 power, just completely hypothetical, it automatically then becomes 300. Um, so you don't have to go crazy buying a ton of eyepieces. If you, you, you in conjunction use a borrower with eyepieces you have, or you buy a couple of eyepieces. Uh, <clears throat> also, you know, just, just remember too, low power eyepieces have wide fields of view. Again, here's the view of the Pleiades. And as you in increase the magnification, your field of view shrinks. That's why you don't want to put in your high power eyepiece right away. Uh, if your telescope isn't lined up just perfectly, you'll be hunting around and getting frustrated. Another thing too, uh, you don't want to um, go too high a power. Let's say you have a, a four inch telescope. Um, they gen generally max out around 200 power, 225 X. An eight inch, um, on a good night, 330 to 350 uh, power, you know, that kind of thing. So you don't want to exceed those things. And that you can calculate that by um, dividing the number of millimeters uh, divided by the focal length. Let's say you have an eight inch Schmidt Cassid rain. Um, you'll divide 14 into 2000 and you'll get your, what kind of, what power that, uh, that, that creates for you. And that's, you know, that's going to be somewhere in the 140 range off yeah. the top of my head. Hey Mark. Uh, yeah. The old rule of thumb was uh, 50, 50 power per inch. Per inch of like aperture. If you've got an Correct. eight inch telescope, well, how much power can I maximum, should I use? Take eight, multiply by, by 50. Right, that's four hundred. On 400, a perfect night, really, on a perfect night, which is really quite high. Right, I mean, very, right. very rarely able to use four hundred power, but uh, you know, that's um, right. We did have some questions in the chat about uh, eyepieces here. Yeah, um, shoot. Uh, Ed uh, was asking about, uh, you know, if, if you're someone who is more into planetary viewing than, mm -hmm. let's say, deep space objects. Uh, and to keep the cost down, what effective magnification or minimum magnification is recommended in the scope to buy? So uh, I would ask what kind of telescope you have. So if let's say hypothetically you have an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain. Um, that was the question. Sorry. Um, it depends on the size of the telescope. It uh, depends on a number of factors, the focal length of the telescope. Um, I would, if you're looking for something for planets, try to keep it 
at 200, given the seeing conditions, he, give a, you know, a 200 power uh, is, is probably, uh, you know, acceptable, I would say. Um, if the seeing conditions were better, then, you know, you can, you can increase uh, power. Um, so it would depend on the, the focal length of his telescope. Uh, and you'd have, you know, you'd have to figure out which eyepiece gets you there. Uh, another way, if you, you know, if you want to not spend a ton of money, is maybe um, for the cost of maybe one of these i one of these expensive eyepieces new, you can get a a Bader eight to twenty four zoom. Uh, I find that's one of the only zoom eyepieces that actually performs on par with a good eye with a you know good uh, single focal length eyepiece. They're really close. Um, so if you want more of a range, um, that's always uh, an option as well. I guess for, for planetary, if you're looking really super interested in planetary, you should be really looking for not magnification, right. but a long focal length, you right. know, something with a relative, like a schmidt green tends to be fairly long focal right. length. And so, you know, you want something with a, a longer focal length will get right. you higher magnifications right. a little easier, you know. You know, if someone had a, a, a tracking Dobsonian, you could also, let's say an eight inch Dob, you can get a similar focal length just by adding a 2X Barlow and then whatever eyepiece you're putting in would be similar. If you're, I'm saying, if you're stuck with a certain type of telescope already, you can emulate that as well uh, with a schmidt cassegrain But yeah, a schmidt cassegrain is is a great choice for planets. Uh, Mark, uh, yeah. I have a question uh, related to the... Uh... Um, finder scopes. Yeah. How, how difficult is it to go from one finder scope to another in terms of the mount? Do the mounts have to be changed? Uh, you know, do the screws line up usually? Uh, a lot of times, um, let's say on a Schmidt Cassegrain uh, or, or just whatever, um, if you're getting a Telrad, if there's a mount that was there before, you might want to remove it. Um, or maybe just put it off to the side, a little staggered. And what I, what I usually do is, um, actually, I'm going to stop my screen share if that's okay for a second. Okay, can everybody see my? Make my box bigger here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. I'm doing it. I had a feeling this was going to happen. <clears throat> okay. So here's a Dobsonian. Um, the finder is on a shoe here already, if you can see that. That's how it's connected to a dovetail. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, they sell those for different types of telescopes. Schmidt Cassegrain has its own style, uh, but mostly like Newtonians and refractors also have their own style. Um, they share the same style. So you can change these out pretty, pretty easily. Um, and it's just two screws. Um, the Telrad is mounted with a special, you know, double-sided mounting tape. Um, and it sticks, just sticks to the telescope. And once it's on, it's on. It's, you know, our club has some that's probably been on there for 20, 30 years and it's still stuck to it. <laughs> when it sticks, it sticks forever, darn near forever. Um, so you need a pretty good alignment to start with, with that tape. Or at least a, an uh, idea. Yeah. Where, where so I'm... if you have like sometimes like a, a flat surface, like a Schmidt Cassegrain will have a flat surface, and I'll back up the base right up to the flat surface, and as long as it's perpendicular, you're pointed straight. You know, mostly straight. So if you your telescope, I would back it all the way up to the where that that uh, ridge is in the back, and and just mount it perpendicular to that, and you should be straight enough. Okay. So you won't have anything to worry about there. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's really all there is to it. Thank you. Back. Now, let me start to share the screen. Yeah. Now, in the meantime, we did have another question. Ed and I had another question about eyepieces. Uh, yeah. Perhaps you could talk just a moment about uh, what's the advantage of a two inch diameter eyepiece compared to a one and a quarter, because there's two different standard sizes of eyepieces, two inch and one and a quarter, right. and are, are the better ones only available in two inch? So 
defining better. Um, it's not better is not necessarily the right word. Um, to so basically, you're trying to get the most amount of field you possibly can into, you know, the eyepiece. Uh, so for instance, a lot of your two inch eyepieces like this one here, this 30 millimeter is 82 degrees. So it shows you more sky uh, than let's say your standard 30, 52 degrees. So it, it's like a narrow piece of the sky. And so that that's why it needs two inches. Uh, it's showing you more, um, more field. It's squeezing more into that, into that, into that, um, into that glass. Um, it's not necessarily better because uh, as you go to higher power, you don't need um, unless you're using really wide eyepieces, like a hundred degrees. And 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 um, they're not necessarily better. It's just a different experience. It's just putting more of the sky into a small into an eyepiece. So you, the more you try to increase the field, like for instance, in these pictures here of the um, of uh, the Pleiades, um, this might be, let's say hypothetically, 30 degree, 30 millimeter, um, 50 degree, you know, hypothetically 50 degrees. You at um, 80 degrees or, or um, you can probably um, you do get this kind of power here with a 20 millimeter eyepiece and get more magnification and still keep that wide field of view. Um, so as far as trying to fit a, a large object into the eyepiece, two inches is better. Uh, as far as looking at planetary detail, um, it could be either or. Um, and, you know, so though that doesn't necessarily matter. Um, so better is not the word, it's just more field of view uh, in the eyepiece. Now, if you have a Dobsonian telescope, like the one I was just showing you, which being pushed manually, having a nice wide field of view, like 80 degrees is beneficial because you don't have to keep nudging the telescope. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, hopefully if that, that answered the question, um, if there's any other, awesome. If there's any other questions, uh, feel free to tell me. I guess one thing that we should uh, mention here is that, uh, you know, if you're a beginner and you're just starting out, uh, Boy, don't go crazy with eyepieces because some of these eyepieces right. are really expensive. In some cases, more expensive than the telescope itself. If you start oh, yeah. adding them up, you know, you buy five or six eyepieces and boy, you know, that really adds up quick. And so, you know, start out with some basic eyepieces. The Barlow is a great idea. You know, yes. start out with a few basic ones and, and, and go from there, you know. And you can also buy them used on cloudynights.com. Yep. So, yep. but. But yes, he, Kevin is absolutely right. So if you're just starting out, uh, learn to use what you have very well. And then you'll start to realize that, hmm, I really want to squeeze the entire uh, Perseus double cluster into one eyepiece into my schmidt cassegrain Well, then, yeah, then you'll, you know, make the investment and, and go with a, a more expensive eyepiece. But um, do it slowly. When you do, you go down that road. It's a rabbit hole. I'm warning you. Um, start with, you know, your lowest power first um, and, and then, you know, maybe find something halfway, maybe a 14 um, and then maybe something like an 11 and and then a, then the Barlow. And then so you don't necessarily have to buy the whole giant kit and spend a thousand dollars on eyepieces. You can kind of mimic two or, you know, you can fill two or three different focal lengths with the Barlow that you wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, <clears throat> so Mark, yeah, yeah. There's another question, uh, question from Dave. Uh, higher power eye eyepieces are dimmer, correct? Uh, yes, there's always your per unit aperture, um, yes. So if, if you are going higher power, the object, if you look over to the left here where you see Saturn uh, at three different power levels, uh, it becomes an issue only when you don't have enough aperture in your telescope. Uh, when you increase the power, you're spreading out the light in the eyepiece and it becomes dimmer and dimmer and you lose resolution eventually. So if you have a small telescope, you know, 80 millimeters and you, you're trying to get 400 power out of it, 
you're going to start looking like that image or, or 300 power even. You're going to start looking like this image on the right. Uh, in reality, you kind of, you know, the image of Saturn, you want, you'll be happiest with the image in the middle. It's, you know, bright enough to show you detail and, and big enough to show you detail without it breaking down. Uh, and that's, that's, so there is a, um, you know, a highest theoretical magnification where, you know, it starts to taper off. And if, the larger your telescope is, uh, the higher the power you can go before it starts to, the image starts to degrade. Uh, and that's where that 50, 50 power per inch rule kind of comes into play there, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Uh, Mark, on. can I come in for a second? Yes. Can you hear me? It's Terry. Hey, um, Terry. Uh, one factor that you and I have discussed is these days uh, you can't get as high a magnification as you used to say 10, 15 years ago simply Absolutely. because of the atmosphere itself. Correct. So trying to go too high won't be very productive. That's so, right. So. Yeah. Uh, I find myself, and I have a C8, I have an eight inch Cassegrain, mm -hmm. that generally I don't get much above 250 power. Um, right. Rarely, sometimes I'll go up to 350, um, but the way the atmosphere is here, it limits it quite a lot. Right, I, I had one night, I had one night this year where I was able to push over 350 power, uh, and that was rare. And then literally the night after that, it was the max was 150 again before the, the jet stream. When the jet stream is parked, you know, uh, uh, above us, uh, it tends to, uh, when the air, air currents are moving, it tends to distort the, uh, the objects. And what, what Terry means by, by bad seeing, it kind of looks like, uh, if you ever looked at a, a hot surface, like a road on a hot day and everything, it looks like it's boiling planets will actually under high power uh will start to mimic that um and that's the rivers of air and the atmosphere are moving too fast uh, and there's you know air currents you know temperature in the upper atmosphere is uh disrupted and it breaks down you know uh, the image scale so you can only go uh, a certain amount of power All right, Mark, so, uh, another question came in. Yeah, go ahead. Is there a difference in the image quality between using a 30 millimeter with a 2x Barlow versus a 15 millimeter with no Barlow? Um, oftentimes I say no, and it depends on the eyepiece. Um, the only thing I, um, with an inexpensive Palasol, uh, the higher the power, the more the glass quality starts to break. You know, the image isn't as good. Uh, so on an inexpensive, you know, Palasol, I would do that. I would bar low at 25 millimeter or a 30, 32 millimeter. Um, once you start getting below, let's say, you know, 15, 12 millimeters, those, those inexpensive Palasols just really can't hold up. And so I actually find using a bar low is, is better. Uh, and plus, it's more comfortable to look through a bigger, uh, a more glass than it does through a tiny little little hole. Um, the more expensive eyepieces like the um, Explore Scientific and Teleview and, and you know, Celestron, Luminos and those, they, they're, those lenses are larger even in the uh, higher power. So it's not as big a deal. Okay. Um, so very quickly, I'm going to go over uh, go-to uh, alignments because a lot of folks now have telescopes with a computer. And it can be confusing to some, uh, some folks that are A, not computer savvy, or B, don't have a basic fundamental understanding of what stars are in the sky. And, and you know, um, so most times I'll, I'll tell folks, you, you want to, at least learn what the bright stars are in the season. And, and, and Kevin will get into that uh, shortly. I'm just gonna touch on it here. Uh, and that's important um, because, you know, most of your uh, go-to telescopes, you'll wanna pick two, three, four, depending, usually it's two, it could be up to five alignment stars. Um, 
and the more stars it lines up on, the better the model inside the computer is more accurate. Um, so usually you'll, you'll want to pick those two stars uh, and they're on opposite sides of the sky so the telescope can orient itself. <clears throat> so when you, when usually, and I'm picking Celestron here because it's the most common, but many of the other st styles like Mead and, and, and Orion and Skywatcher, they, they follow a similar type of thing. Um, there's also a video here, you know, to save time, I'm not going to show it. I will post it on the IO group also, as well as on our, our Facebook page. I'll basically, um, uh, you'll, if you're looking on Facebook, it'll be with our, in our Facebook feed. It'll, uh, one, one of them will be on how to line up your finder scope and the other one will be how to align the uh, Celestron uh, telescopes. So again, you want to use your low power eyepiece. Um, you, you're going to enter your, more often than not, the date, the time, um, and your location. Um, and once you do that once, it often remembers it, unless you change where you're viewing from. Um, you know, <clears throat> again, you want to, uh, for your first star, oftentimes you're going to manually slew the telescope to that star. And then you center it in the finder scope, then the, and the, uh, then the actual eyepiece, and you'll hit enter and align. <clears throat> and then the telescope will ask you to choose a second star. Um, you'll want to choose a second star probably on the other side of the sky from the first star. So it can build a nice, you know, even model of the sky. And once it knows it centered, you centered a second star, uh, it then aligns its internal model with this with the sky at that time. So at that point, you can then go to all these other objects automatically without knowing where they are. Now, eventually, you do want to learn where these objects are, but this will at least get you, um, especially if you're in a light polluted suburb, uh, this will get you there without having to fight the light pollution. Basically, and most of these hand controllers are very similar. Um, you know, you have your directional keys, you know, up, down, right, left. Uh, um, you'll, uh, solar system, that's for planets. Deep sky, that'll give you different uh, object catalogs, uh, whether they're Messier or uh, the uh, NG, new general catalog. There's a few different catalogs. So you can pick the sky. You can also go, uh, if you don't know any of these things, you can pick um, star tour or sky tour, and it'll find the best things that are available that time of the year, and you can go to them. <clears throat> you can, uh, as you learn more and more about the, the hand controller, uh, you can adjust the motor speed. There's all these different things now. Uh, one of the things I didn't put in here is a lot of your telescopes now are running with uh, apps to run in your smartphone. Um, so if you have a Wi-Fi based telescope, um, there's often an app to go with it and you can drive it even from your smartphone or your iPad or whatever, but they do basically the same thing as your hand controller does here. And, uh, you'll see this again, this is a suggested reading, uh, Night Watch by, uh, Terrence Dickinson. Um, there's been many versions of this. You can pick this up, use. It'll talk to you about equipment. It'll talk to you about um, star charts, uh, how to learn the sky um, backwards and forwards. Uh, also, this one's out of print, but you can pick them up used on Amazon pretty cheaply. The Beginner's Observing side, uh, Scott Guide by Leo Enright. <clears throat> it comes in multiple covers. You know, sometimes you see one with a, with a comet on there. That's, it's the same book. Um, the star charts are great. Uh, it takes you through the sky over the course of a year, which is the best way to learn. If you go out maybe one, two, three times a month to learn the sky, uh, by the time a year goes, goes by, you'll, you'll become really proficient um, and start to learn where some of these objects are. Okay. Uh, Mark? Uh, so, yes. Uh, a couple of questions came in. I hate to interrupt in the middle of- Yeah, no, no worries. That. Uh, one back to eyepieces. Uh, okay. What, what should someone who wears eyeglasses consider regarding eyepieces? Okay, that's actually important. Um, I'm glad they actually asked that. So there is something called eye relief, and I'm going to stop this screen share for a second. 
And it's a good thing I have an eyepiece case. Yeah, eye relief, yeah. Yeah. Eye relief is basically um, the distance from the glass, the glass and the eyepiece to your, your eye pupil. And so if you're wearing glasses, um, the, you're gonna be further away from the eyepiece. So you, it's gonna make an, you want it to make an image further out and not so close to the glass. Um, there are, this particular one uh, is actually pretty good. So you, with eyeglass wearers, you want an eyepiece advertised with about 19, 20 millimeters or a little more. Uh, it'll, it'll say that on the eyepiece description um, this Explore Scientific eyepiece uh, has something like 26, which is really good for eyeglass wearers. But 20 millimeters of eye relief is, uh, is important. If, you're, if you plan on wearing glasses, um, uh, Bader Morpheus, Teleview Delos, um, some of the inexpensive Orion Planetary eyepieces, um, anything that's that's got long eye relief um, uh, advertised on there uh, is uh, exactly where you uh, where you want to be. Yeah, Mark, uh, the one thing that we should uh, mention is that um, if you have a, a fairly simple uh, eye problem, let's say if it's if you're nearsighted or far side far sighted it's I, I find it just easier to take my glasses off and you just focus with for your eyes and it's right. really not a problem uh the the real problem that comes in is if you have an astigmatism, astigmatism or some other right. problem uh right. there is a, a way around that and i think the television still makes it there's a diop a dioptrics dioptrics uh, yep adapter that you can correct for a, a little bit of astigmatism, uh, right. but uh, it's sort of an extra lens, I think, that you, you can buy to screw into the eyepiece to help with right. astigmatism problems. I, I don't know exactly how uh, well they work, but uh, but uh, it's it's a, a possible option. It but, is an uh, option. If you're just, just if, it's, if it's simple, if you have a simple issue like being nearsighted or farsighted, you, that's no problem at all. Take your glasses off and just focus and, and right. it'll be, you'll be fine, you know. So Right, the telescope becomes your prescription. You just change it, to focus it to your prescription, so to speak. Yeah, right. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, one other question came in regarding alignment. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you recommend uh, good reference stars in this part of New Jersey? Uh, well, it's not necessarily part of New Jersey. So uh, again, that changes uh, every time of the year. Um, what I would do, um, Again, I would tell people to learn, get your star charts. You can get them um, freestarcharts.com or whatsouttonight.com. Um, you can download free star charts and that will change. Your stars in the winter will not be the same stars in the spring or in the summer. Uh, and Kevin actually will get into that. Uh, but that being said, um, in the winter, maybe I would say Sirius would be one of them. Uh, Capella might be another one, um, you know. Right, Rigel, Adebron, you know, those right. light stars. So, yeah, in the wintertime, it's it's pretty easy to find some good alignment stars because we have so many bright stars visible. But, um, right. yeah, it changes through the year. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it's it, – and actually, that's an important point, and we're going to segue into the next part of our presentation here. But uh, that's an important point for these go-to telescopes – you know, uh, it's uh, it's not magic. You know, um, you know sometimes the uh, marketing for these telescopes is a little out of control, and the way that you you read the ads and it, you think like you're going to open the box and the telescope is going to just going to point itself. Uh, but uh, no, it's it's pretty dumb. You've got to tell it where to point. You've got to use those guide stars, as as Mark mentioned. Uh, you you got to tell where it's tell it where it's pointing at first. Uh, and then from there, I can go off and find objects for you. Right. But uh, you got to set it up correctly the, the, to begin with. And 
once you've set it up and you, you, you're going to be using it, well, then you have to know what to look at. You know, uh, the, the field of view on these telescopes, uh, uh, just about all telescopes, is pretty darn small. And so the chances of you randomly pointing it at the sky and finding something spectacular is pretty remote. It occasionally happens, but, uh, you know, you got to know where to point your telescope. And so that's what our next part of our presentation is about, is uh, um, about the sky. Yes. Kevin, if I might come in there yeah. too. Sure. I, I got the next star SC, mm -hmm. the 8SC, uh, the Celestron one. Right. And the nice thing about that, and, you know, read the manuals because that will help anybody that's, you know, starting to figure this out. But all you have to do is point it at a particular star uh, without even knowing what it is. And you do that two or three times and it will align for you anyway. So that makes life very easy if you don't know the sky. And um, I found that very useful for that particular telescope. And probably most of the new ones are able to do that. Okay. Uh, well, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the, the sky here. Uh, we do have uh, different stars visible throughout the year. And so uh, I guess, uh, Mark, if you go on to the next slide here. Yep. Um, as Mark mentioned, you know, at our latitude, we're uh, almost 41 degrees uh, north uh, latitude, and uh, the north pole of the Earth is pointing very close to the star Polaris, which we nickname uh, the North Star. And so that's uh, a very important star for alignment, especially if you're using an equatorial telescope for the Dobsonians, the Alta Asthma telescopes is not quite so important, I guess, but, uh, but for uh, uh, equatorial telescopes that track the sky, it's critical to get the telescope pointed at the North Star. And uh, when you're looking north, uh, all these stars are pivoting around uh, the North Star. And so during the wintertime, uh, the Big Dipper is actually sometimes hard to see. It's down low. And so you can see on the right-hand side, there's a little diagram of the Big Dipper kind of rotating around the North Star through the seasons. And so in the winter, it's down low. In the spring, it starts to, to climb up. In the summer, it's way high, kind of upside down in the northern sky. And then in the fall, it creeps back down over in the northwest. And so you know, these stars are moving around the pole. And so that's why we call them circumpolar stars. And so uh, the Big Dipper definitely comes in handy uh, for helping you find the North Star. Uh, contrary to popular opinion, uh, it is not the brightest star in the nighttime sky. It's actually pretty pretty ordinary star. If you make a top 100 list of brightest stars, Polaris comes in at number 51, if I remember correctly. And so it's, it's not that bright. So you need something else to help you. And the Big Dipper is really helpful in finding uh, the North Star over there in the northern sky. If you really have a, a trouble finding, if you have trouble finding yourself getting oriented, you know, just a regular uh, ordinary magnetic compass will get you pointed roughly in the right direction. Uh, the the uh, magnetic north doesn't point exactly towards the the North Star, but I'll get you in, the, in roughly the right direction, at least. I, I, I do that often, especially when I'm setting up somewhere where I haven't been before. I'm not sure which direction is which. I'll pull out a magnetic compass, just get myself oriented to start out. So, okay, let's uh, move on to the next slide. Uh, something that comes uh, in, in handy uh, when uh, we're talking about astronomy, uh, we talk about distances in the sky, angular distances in the sky a lot. And if that uh, puzzles you, well, uh, your hand comes in really handy for measuring things in the sky. And this may seem kind of counterintuitive, but it, it does generally work for, for just about everyone. Uh, uh, you know, your hand, if you, let's say, take your, your fist, and hold it out at arm's length, uh, that uh, can uh, be a good, uh, a good indication of, of size. And so uh, the Big Dipper, for example, is the size of your, ha of your hand. If you hold your pinky out and your thumb out, uh, that's about 25 degrees. That's about the size of the Big Dipper. Uh, 10 degrees is your fist and uh, one degree is your pinky. And so that helps you sometimes for, if someone says, well, something's 10 degrees off the horizon. Uh, if you wanna see Mars as 10 degrees off the horizon, well, where is that? Well, it's one fist above the horizon. And so that comes in very handy for finding your way around the sky, that helps. Okay, uh, 
the uh, Chris, as we mentioned, the, the sky is changing uh, throughout the year. Uh, the Earth, of course, is uh, in its moving in its orbit uh, around the sun. Uh, we just passed the winter solstice, which you see on the right hand side there, and we're heading towards the vernal equinox, uh, towards uh, March 20th or so, uh, is the vernal equinox. Then during the summertime, uh, the Earth is in the opposite part of its orbit as it is in the winter, and then comes back around uh, to the autumn. Uh, and so the Earth is moving around. And as you'll notice, the night side of the Earth is pointing in completely different directions. And so that's what causes our sky to slowly change. You're seeing the orbital motion of the Earth. And so the sky is slowly changing as we go through the year. And this goes just another illustration of that, uh, that, uh, you know, as time goes on, the night side is pointed in different directions at different constellations. So for example, uh, Scorpius, I just had someone the, the other night, I was giving a presentation and uh, someone asked, well, why can't I see Scorpius in the wintertime sky? Well, that's because the sun is blocking our view of Scorpius at this point. Uh, we can turn around and face directly away from Scorpius and we see our friend, the constellation Orion and uh, Gemini and Taurus. And so uh, uh, some constellations are hidden by the sun and and so uh, uh, there's definitely a, a seasonal variation uh, to these constellations. And so as time goes on, you know, it, it does take time to learn these stars and constellations. Uh, some people will ask us this, how the heck do you remember the names of all these stars? Well, over time, you're seeing the same stars and constellations over and over again, year after year. And eventually you, they become like old friends and you see them rising up. And you, you, uh, I always, one thing I always do is I look for Orion or when I see Orion over in the Western sky or sorry, Eastern sky uh, around Thanksgiving, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the, 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 the signal for, for Thanksgiving is that Orion's belt starts to be, become visible over in the eastern sky just around that time after sunset. And uh, so uh, you can kind of, the sky makes a pretty good calendar. Okay. So let's uh, move on here. Um, of course, uh, very popular objects in our sky, especially with beginners, is the moon and the planets. And a lot of people wonder, well, why can't I see Venus right now? Why can't I see Mercury or Jupiter and Saturn? Uh, in fact, actually, we had a very nice uh, meeting of Jupiter and Saturn, conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn late in December, which you may have heard about. Well, where are they now? Well, they're gone. They've been moving all this time. The Earth is moving in its orbit. They're moving in their orbits. And we've kind of left them behind. And now uh, they are pretty much gone. Uh, you might be able to just get a bare glimpse of them after sunset, but they're so low now that uh, you really can't get a good view of them. Uh, but don't worry, you know, it'll come back. <laughs> you know, it'll come back around uh, uh, summertime. Uh, both Jupiter and Saturn will be back in the sky uh, in the summer. Uh, in the evening sky in the summer. So uh, and so it changes all the time. Uh, you know, the, these planets are in different uh, parts of the sky. And so sure, you might see a planet right after sunset, like we, we see Mars right now in the evening sky. Uh, but you might have to wait for some of those other planets until two, three o'clock in the morning, sometimes until dawn to see some of those other planets rising up in the east. Uh, so it varies and it's always changing. There's no season. That's another common question. What season can I see Mars? Well, there is no particular season. It's uh, constantly changing from year to year. So keep that in mind. And that's where uh, things like apps come, come in handy. They can show you where the planets are going to be and what time they rise and that sort of thing. So, okay, let's uh, move on. Um, so I'd like to talk about the yeah. moon, okay? So Go ahead. one of the things I really like to look at for the, is the moon and I think it's so available for beginners that you can see it really, really easily. So here's a picture of the full moon. And we're gonna look at some of the pieces of it a little bit more in detail. But first thing you notice about the moon is it's got different areas of light color and different areas of darker gray. So um, sometimes people see patterns in those. Next. So different cultures see different things. So generally there's the man in the moon, the lady in the moon, and the rabbit in the moon. So these are the same pictures 
of the moon, but things are drawn on them. So uh, the left-hand one there is the man on the moon. That's a full face view, like a, a pumpkin. He's looking at you, maybe a little to your left. He has two big eyes, a uh, little nose, and a kind of a smirky smile there at the bottom in dark. So that's the man on the moon. Uh, that was favored in Europe. Um, then in the middle one, we have the lady in the moon, and she's a profile view. She's looking sort of upwards toward the left. She has light skin and dark hair. Her hair is drawn back into two braids or ponytails. And this was favored mainly in Eastern Europe. And she has a diamond in her necklace at the bottom. That's really, really hard to see. Um, but we'll talk about that one a little later. It's called the crater Tycho now. So then on the third one to the right, we have the rabbit in the moon. And this is a dark but kind of spotted rabbit. He's jumping from your right to your left. He has long ears that trail over his body. He's got two front feet and he's got two back feet and a little, little round tail uh, off sort of behind him. And now if you look at all three, you can see it's the same dark and light spots, but what you tend to emphasize gets you either a man, a lady, or a rabbit. The rabbit is mainly seen in Asia, Japan, and China. Next. So the dark areas, oh. yeah, go back one. There we go. So the dark areas are called mare, uh, and the single, and then there's maria. It's not maria, it's maria. And that's the Latin for ocean or, or sea. Uh, so the mare regions were originally thought to be lakes or, or oceans of dark, dark water, uh, but they're not at all. Um, that was just a problem people had in the, in the 1600s. At any rate, uh, Galileo and his friends uh, named them. And so the dark areas that are on the left side, which are sort of the rabbit's front end, are for states of weather. So there's a sea of rain and fog and cold weather and all sorts of things like that. The ones on the right hand side, the dark ones there are the lady's hair or the rabbit's back legs. Uh, and those are states of mind. So we have um, tranquility and serenity and crisis. Um, so all sorts of psychological things uh, that they named them for there. Okay, next. So the lighter areas are indeed higher and the darker areas are depressed. They are lowlands. So they could have been seas, I guess. And so the lighter areas are called the lunar highlands and the dark areas are the mare or seas. Um, they were in, in some sense seas long, long ago. They were seas of molten rock, molten lava. And then it's all solidified, so you walk around it like it's on a parking lot. Uh, and there's the names of some of them you could see there. Next. So I have some questions about the Apollo moon landings. And I think these are interesting for newcomers to know about, uh, but also for those of us who will be teaching newcomers at telescope nights, if we ever get telescope nights again. And I would like people to, to learn these facts and be able to tell people about them because people and people will often ask you. So anyway, here's my first question to everybody. And I want somebody to answer. Uh, how many people ever landed on the moon? Twelve. J Jason knows twelve. <laughs> okay, Jason certainly knows. And Jason knew it was twelve. I hope other people knew it was twelve. Or if not, that now they do know it's 12. Okay, so here's- Someone in the chat room has raised their hand. And what'd they say? You have to type the name in the, type the, the answers in the chat room, I guess. So here's another one, not Jason to be answered. Uh, what countries were they from? Not the States. US, trick question. <laughs> yes, it is in some sense a trick question. Uh, all of them were, all 12 were from the United States. Um, but if you talk about this at telescope nights, you'll find a lot of people think that there were Russians on the moon. 
There have never been any Russians on the moon. We should be proud that there were only Americans on the moon. And, and, uh, and I think that's kind of a neat thing to know. And especially teenagers are very surprised at that. They're really amazed that it's only Americans were ever on the moon. Now, so here's another one that we want not Chris and not Jason to answer. Um, can you name the first two moonwalkers? Somebody type it in there. Aldrin yep. and Armstrong says Ed. Ed yep. wins yep. gold star. Good job, Ed. Um, yes. And these are both, these are important people historically and important people to me uh, because I grew up in Ohio and now I live in Montclair. And so there's a connection there. So Ed, do you know the connection? Where's, where's Ed going? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I took my headphone off for a second. I had to call up, I missed the question. What was the question, Mary Lou? <laughs> <laughs> um, why, why are Armstrong and Aldrin important to me uh, in that I grew up in Ohio and I live now in Montclair what does this have to do with these two folks? Um, uh, Buzz Aldrin was from Montclair, no? Yes, and he grew and, up and he went to Montclair High School. Montclair yeah, High School. And, and, um, and Armstrong, was he from Ohio? Yeah, he's from oh, Ohio. Oh, from Ohio. Ah. There you go. Midwesterner. <laughs> 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 but at any rate, there you go. Buzz Lightyear. Okay. Um, so here's another one. Mm. Uh, what criteria governed the choice of the spot to land on the moon. Somebody picked a spot. What, what criteria did they use? And there were several. Yeah. Dave, illumination and line of sight comms. Yes. Comms. So first uh, they wanted them to land in daylight so they could see where they were walking around without headlamps. And second, they wanted to be on the front side of the moon as we see it so that communication could be done easily. None of this go around to the back and hide stuff. Um, so that's two of them. And then there's a third one. They were around the equator. They're around the equator. Uh, so there's a fourth one. So the, <laughs> the around the equator business was because that's more or less in the plane of the orbits of coming from the earth to the moon. So you wouldn't have to go north or south. You just sort of land somewhere around the equator. And Jason now says, topography. What do you mean by that, Jason? OK, yeah, I'm going to need to know. They wanted to find a place where they can land and not worry about you know, it being relatively level. So they don't have to worry about the, you know, landing at an angle or in a, in a, it being be a predicament where they wouldn't be able to, uh, if they didn't want to be able to land you know, level. Great, they wanted, to, they wanted to land on the parking lot and not on the side of a mountain or something, right. And eventually with the other ones, as uh, he said, a place where you could then drive off in a little buggy to go somewhere else. So flat here and flat in around. Um, so there are a lot of things to think of and uh, they picked a bunch of them. Next. So here's where the six, uh, moon landings took place on a, on a picture of the, of the full moon. So the one that people really want to see for uh, at public telescope nights is the one that's got the eagle on it. So on the right hand side toward the middle there, it's got the little brown eagle on it. Uh, that's Apollo 11, um, the first moon landing. And then we branched out a little bit further to some of the others. Um, but I think it's really fun as a beginner to find the moon, which is easy, and then to get a map like this, and then to look around with your telescope and see if you could find more or less the places where these people actually put down on the moon's surface. So let's think about Apollo 11, the first moon landing. It's right there. Next. So here we have a picture of first quarter moon. It's in the right-hand side of the moon, so it's going to be on this picture somewhere. And so I find it easy to locate. So when you have a first quarter, you start at the top of the moon and you go halfway down to the bottom. So right in there is a good place to stop. So that's halfway top to bottom. Then you turn and you go halfway from the center to the edge. <laughs> and you go back and do that again. 
and you go over there and that's a sea of tranquility right there and that's where they landed. So that's sort of fun, you know, halfway, halfway, easy to do. Now next. Then there's some interesting craters on the moon that are fun to find. Some are uh, interesting because they're big or energetic or interesting color contrast or something like that. So I've picked a couple that I like to look at when the moon is out trying to find them. So in the left hand picture here, it's the full moon. And I like to find crater Tycho. It's down toward the bottom, but not right at the bottom. It's that one right there. It's not a very big crater, but it's got a tremendous splash system. So the under soil on the moon is lighter than the top soil. And it, if you dig deep, you splash it up and it goes all the way to the edge, almost every, every place, and particularly the one, the splash that goes to the upper right, that one right up there, it goes over the edge of the moon. So this must have been a very energetic impact. This rock hit there and blasted up the dirt. So it went all the way around to the other side of the moon before it fell down. So really quite an energetic thing and uh, be very glad you weren't standing there when it hit. That would, would have been disaster. All right, then on the next side over here to the right is crater Plato. Um, and this one is interesting in that it has a very dark interior. So whatever rock hit this place dug deep enough that it got to the inner melted parts of the moon. It just sort of welled up and filled it and made it like a uh, chocolate pudding or something like that. A really dark, flat base to this crater here. Uh, you can see by the shadows there on the right that the edge of the crater is not smooth. It's very raggedy. And there's a big, big mountain right about there that casts quite a shadow into the middle of the crater if you're lucky enough to see it. So on the full moon on the left hand side, we could find cr crater Plato. It's up near the top right there at the edge of one of the Mare regions. So that's sort of interesting to see the really dark crater. Next. So here's two more that I think are fun, Copernicus and Proclus. So Copernicus is a large crater. It's interesting in that it has a terraced wall. So if you start at the rim and you go down into the crater, you go down, clump, 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 rather than a smooth wall going down. So it was fairly energetic and it threw out wads of dirt that got stuck in these terraces. Uh, this one turns out it's sort of to the left, it's kind of the rabbit's, part of the rabbit's eye or something. On the right hand image here, we have uh, Proclus, which has a V-shaped ejecta blanket. It's off to the right uh, on the moon by the rabbit's tail. That's Crisis, the big black thing there. And Proclus is right, little one right to the edge there, right in there. And the white ejecta that it flew out, blew out, um, met some sort of resistance, like a, a little mountain range or a big boulder or something, just to the left of it, and that blocked it. So it has this white apron that has a big V-shape into it. I think that's interesting and it's easy to find, very easy to find Proclus on the moon. Next. Now here's some that are more difficult to locate, but if you really try hard, you can eventually find them. So on the left here, we have Aristarchus, which is in the upper left. You have to stay up till the moon is quite gibbous, nearly full to see it. And it's very bright, very white in its bottom. Um, it seems to have dug deep into the subsoil, but not deep enough to release the lava. And it has interesting rills, which are like little canyons coming off of it. Um, it's an interesting area to explore with a telescope. Then in the middle top picture there, we have Clavius. Uh, Clavius is down toward the bottom of the moon and it has an interesting set of craterlets on its interior. So there's the one that's the big one on the left. It goes bloop, 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 bloop. Little ones in a really nice row and not sure how that ever happened, but it's really artistic and fun to look at, to find Clavius. All right, the one that's really hard to find, but so much fun if you actually do it, is the one below that, and it's called Sacrobosco. So it looks like a face. Do you see the two eyes and the open mouth? It's going, oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
So in the big picture on the right, Mr. Uh, Boo, Mr. Boo, oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, on the big picture on the right, there's a red circle. So part way down, not far from the center, and that's where Sacrobosco is. Can you show the where the circle is? There it is, right there. Um, and also, I think it's interesting. This was named for John Sacrobosco. Uh, Sacro means sacred or holy, and Bosco means wood or forest. So this is the, the holy wood, and his name often nowadays is just written as Hollywood, so like in California. So this is the Hollywood face creator. Okay, next. And now it's back to Kevin. Okay. You um, see a pig. Well, okay. All right. Pig. <laughs> there you go. Right? There you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> J Jason had an interesting comment in the chat that the uh, Apollo 20 uh, mission, which of course unfortunately never really happened, they were planning to land that inside crater Tycho. Whoa, wouldn't that have been yeah, so that cool? That would have been spectacular, you know, great. Oh, great. Yeah. Now, speaking of which, uh, you know, we've been, uh, Mary Lewis mentioned uh, uh, a little bit about the uh, phases of the moon. And so, um, you know, of course, uh, uh, as a lot of people know, uh, the uh, moon does seem to change shape. Uh, it, it is quite quite difficult to visualize this, and it's hard to do this. It's so much easier to do this in, in person than it is to do it uh, online because we're limited to two dimensional diagrams. It's kind of tough. But uh, the I guess the important thing is to remember is that yeah, the moon is. Uh, uh, orbiting around the Earth, and as it is moving, that's what causes the the, the phases uh, to change, and it repeats in a 29 and a half day cycle. So every 29 and a half days, you can, that's the time between full moons, for example, if you want to count full moons, and so uh, uh, this is what uh, causes the changing shape. Um, could we go to the next uh, slide here? Uh, and. You know, as as the moon is orbiting around, it's uh, changing uh, phases. And uh, oh, actually, one thing I did want to mention about the the moon, uh, uh, the media makes a, a lot of, a, a lot of hullabaloo about supermoons and the full moon. Uh, and so a lot of people will call us or or write to us and ask us if we're going to look at the full moon. Uh, and really, that's uh, you know. It's one of the worst times to look at the full moon, uh, to look at the moon because it, it's uh, it's nice for looking at Tycho. I think uh, you know it's nice to look for the ejecta on Tycho. But if you want to see some real detail, some of those craters, it's best to look either before full moon or after. So near last quarter and first quarter. And so the media gets all excited about the full moon, but we get more excited about the first quarter and last quarter because those are so much more interesting. The uh, uh, light, the sunlight is kind of lighting up all those craters and mountains and you get some really beautiful detail in a telescope. When you look at a telescope at the full moon, it's kind of flat looking and it's not really, at least I find it not quite as interesting. Uh, the only advantage there is, is, as mentioned, as you can see, the ejecta uh, put out by Tycho and other craters like that. Profile and, and release, nice. yeah. Yeah, it's a profile view when you're looking at uh, near first quarter. So, and that's not the only thing that goes through phases. And so if we go on to the next uh, slide here, uh, we have two planets uh, in the solar system that will go through similar phases uh, and that's Mercury and Venus. And they are, you know, sometimes called inferior planets. We're not dissing them. Uh, we're just saying that they're closer to the sun than we are. They're interior to us. And the uh, other planets that are further away, those are the outer planets uh, or superior planets. You don't see them, to ref see them referred to that way quite so often anymore. But uh, uh, the planets Mercury and Venus are inside of our orbit. And as they go around, they're lit up differently. Uh, sometimes the night side of Venus is facing us and we can't really see it. The same thing with, with Mercury, but as it orbits around, well, then it's illuminated. We get to see the illuminated part of those planets. And so when you look at Venus and Mercury through a telescope, uh, you can watch them go through these phases. And that was a very important uh, observation for Galileo, uh, 
uh, for Galileo when he first uh, was observing the sky. Uh, that's one of the ways he knew that uh, these planets were orbiting the sun and not the earth. And so uh, you can kind of replicate those uh, observations uh, on, your, on your own with even a small telescope. You don't need very much magnification to see the phases of either Mercury or Venus. And so definitely check those out. Okay, uh, now the outer planets, uh, those are a little bit easier to, to view because uh, they get far away from there. They can be seen in the sky far away from the sun uh, when it's nice and dark. And so you don't have to look uh, at sunrise or sunset. Uh, that's when you have to look at Venus and Mercury because they're so close to the sun. You can only see them at sunrise and sunset. You'll never see Venus at, at midnight. Uh, but uh, uh, these other planets are, are visible sometimes throughout the, the whole night, uh, depending on the, where their position is. But we've got, of course, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, uh, the other major planets in the outer solar system. And so um, these are uh, pretty easy to view if they're high enough in the sky. And so, uh, you know, we could take a look at some of these, a little bit closer look at some of these planets. Uh, right now, the only bright planet that we have in the evening sky right now is Mars. Uh, I think I mentioned a little earlier that uh, Venus, sorry, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are a little bit too low now uh, after sunset. And so if we're kind of uh, out of luck for those two planets, at least for the ne next uh, few months until they come back into the sky in the spring and the summer. Uh, but uh, Mars is still pretty high. And so you can check that out. It's, uh, if you go outside around between, let's say, six and seven o'clock, uh, it's, it's really high up. It's almost overhead at this point. And so just go outside face south, look straight up, and there's Mars. You'll see this bright red point of light in the sky. And so um, you can take a look at that. It's not quite as nice to look at a telescope right now because it's getting further away from us. It's further from the sun, so it moves more slowly, so we're leaving it behind. And so it's getting further and further away from us as time goes on. Uh, but, uh, you know, just the way that uh, uh, Mars orbits, it's one orbit for Mars uh, takes two Earth years, uh, so it will not be back close to us again for another two years from, from October. October, last October was the close approach, and so another two years from now, uh, it'll be back in the evening sky. Uh, so uh, check it out before it gets too far away from us. You can often see the um, ice cap, uh, and you can see the ice cap there at the bottom. The southern ice cap is usually visible. Uh, when it gets close to us. And so try to ch check that out before it gets too far away. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh, Jupiter is probably one of the easier planets to view because it's so big, even though it's, uh, what, uh, 500 million miles away from us, uh, it's uh, a big planet. And so uh, very easy to, to see, even in a small telescope at low magnification, you can see some of the nice uh, stripes in its atmosphere. And so you get these nice bands and stripes uh, of clouds going across its face. And you can usually spot those even in small telescopes. Uh, we see here a picture of uh, Jupiter's great red spot. And uh, that is very famous, uh, but it, it can sometimes be tough to view. It is small and you have to have some nice steady skies. And you also have to be looking at the right time. It's not always visible. Some people are surprised by that, but uh, you know, Jupiter turns just like the Earth turns, uh, but it takes, a, 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 it takes 10 hours. It's a very quick day. This giant planet, uh, which is what uh, almost 1200 times larger than Earth, uh, spins once in only 10 hours. And so you got to look at the right time. If you're looking at uh, Jupiter and the red spot is on the other side, obviously you're not going to see it. And so uh, there's apps and also Sky and Telescope magazine lists time, the best time is to see the, the great red spot. Uh, Phil, actually, I see a question from Phil in the, in the chat about has the red spot stabilized now? Wasn't it getting smaller for a while, a year or so ago? And yeah, uh, even longer than that, it seems to have been getting smaller and perhaps weakening and get a little more circular, if I remember correctly. Uh, and it has had some color changes. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that that shrink is, has continued. I, I don't think it has really stopped. I don't think it's stabilized. But 
you know, uh, only time will tell uh, whether or not it continues. It's been around for a long time. It's been around for 400 years. As long as we've had telescopes, we've seen a, a, a big storm in the southern hemisphere of Jupiter. And so uh, perhaps it'll go for another 400 years. We don't really know. Uh, but uh, it does seem to get energy from other storms. It can absorb other storms. And so perhaps it'll absorb some more storms and, and, and pick up again and uh, get bigger. Uh, so we'll just have to see how that goes. Uh, by the way, uh, another really nice thing to look for is the moons of Jupiter. Uh, the four largest, uh, known as the Galileo moons after Galileo, uh, those are so big that you can see them in binoculars. You don't even need the telescope. Just take your binoculars out, point them there, and you might see two or three or four of, of the moons uh, orbiting around Jupiter. And you can actually even watch them move. Uh, you know, Take a look at them in the early evening, go back a couple hours and take a look again, and you'll notice that they've moved. You can actually watch them orbiting the planet which is really amazing. Okay, let's go on to the next. Uh, here's a, a showcase object of everyone's favorite planet, uh, Saturn. Uh, and uh, it's got this beautiful set of rings, you know, more than 200,000 miles across. And so even though Saturn is a billion miles from the sun, uh, it's, uh, it's easily visible, even in a small telescope. You don't need very much magnification, maybe 40 or 50 power. And you can see that the rings, if you use a little bit higher power, well, then you can uh, uh, get a little bit of a better view. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a really pretty, pretty planet to look at, uh, a nice showcase object. And often you can see some of its moons. Uh, it, it's further out than, uh, than Jupiter, so you don't see quite as many. But Titan, yeah, Titan is one of the brighter, bigger, brighter ones. And so that's uh, usually pretty easy to spot uh, somewhere near uh, Saturn. So uh, there is, so there is uh, Saturn, uh, another uh, planet that we can see right now in the evening sky is Uranus, and it's actually fairly close to Mars. And uh, this, you know, technically, technically Uranus is visible to the naked eye. And I know certainly people who live out in Arizona, places like Arizona, where they have really dark skies, or really clear, steady skies. Uh, yeah, they've uh, certainly been able to spot uh, Uranus uh, with the naked eye. I've never been able to do it from New Jersey. Uh, we have too much light pollution and our, our, our skies are not quite as steady as Arizona. And so I've never been able to see it, but it, it can be found in binoculars. It's bright enough to see in binoculars. And uh, you don't really see very much. You know, you're talking about an object that's what, uh, 1.8 billion miles from the sun. And so it's pretty far out there, uh, but you can see the color, the sort of bluish green color really uh, stands out. Okay, do we have, um, do we also have Neptune here? Yeah, Neptune is another object, uh, obviously not visible to the naked eye at all. Uh, you need to see, uh, you need a good sized telescope to, to, to get a nice view of it, uh, but uh, it can be done. In fact, actually we had an event at the Great Swamp. Uh, Mary Lou, do you remember, uh, what telescope or what size telescope are we using to see Neptune at that time? I, I think it was like an eight, eight inch scope, right. something of that sort. Right. Um, I think it was Mark, Mark Seals. Right. Uh, and so we were pretty sure we knew where Neptune was. And the, the way you tell Neptune from the stars is it's really quite distinctly bluish green. Right. It's, it's not right. pastel like the stars are always very pastel. Right. It really has some color you can see. And little children have a better color vision than do adults. So there happened to be a five-year-old there. Right. So I said, we're going to ask you to look through the telescope and tell us if any of the objects in the telescope you see are distinctly bluish green. And if so, you have discovered Neptune. And she got so excited. <laughs> and we had lined it up properly. And there it was. And she found Neptune. And so she was going to go home and tell her kindergarten teacher the next day that she had discovered Neptune and uh, found it in the sky. And it was really very exciting to see his little kid hopping around. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. I remember that. Was that. that was really fun. You know, I don't so, think she was the only one excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So another nice object to look for. Uh, and of course, a lot of people ask about Pluto. Uh, Pluto, uh, uh, you know, is, is even further out. You're talking about f almost 4 billion miles from the sun. And it's really small and very tiny and very far away. 
And sure, you can point your telescope. It's it'd probably be a new database for your telescope uh, if you have a go-to telescope. Uh, you can point it at Pluto. You're not going to see it, but you can point it there, and you can say, "Oh well, this section of the sky is where Pluto is," and that's about so it. So you can say, "I've looked uh, at Pluto." I've looked at Pluto. You know, uh, sure, sure. Some people have spotted uh, uh, Pluto visually. Uh, with the with the eye uh, in a really big telescope, but even then you, you look at it and maybe draw a little picture of it, and then come back an hour or two later and draw another picture, and you can see which dot moves, and that's that's it. You know, uh, so very difficult object to to, to view. Uh, in, in, certainly in the IP telescope. somewhere. Yeah, it's in the IP somewhere. So, yeah, somewhere. Yeah. And so. Pluto is smaller than our moon, so if yeah. you want to see what it yeah. looks like, just look at our moon and imagine right. a little smaller. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing much. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Chris, we have uh, objects outside the solar system that we can uh, see. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, people like to look for are double stars, uh, stars that uh, may be gravitationally bound to each other or just simply stars that uh, appear next to each other. Uh, in the sky. And so we have uh, a famous uh, double star is uh, Albireo, uh, basically in the constellation Cygnus in the summer sky. Uh, it marks the beak of the, of the swan. That's what Cygnus represents. Uh, we also have the star Castor in Gemini, which is actually a multiple star system, right. uh, but you can uh, uh, see at least two components of it uh, in, a, in a small telescope. And so some people like to hunt down some of these uh, uh, double stars, uh, which are kind of fun, like Alberio is very fun because there's a lot of big co color contrast there. You've got one star that's yellowish, the other star is very blue. And so it's a nice color contrast. Some people like to look for, for double stars. Let's go on to the next object. Of course, um, nebula. Nebula are very popular. When you open an astronomy book, there's always lots of big, colorful pictures of nebulas. And we're fortunate that right now we have the Orion uh, Nebula visible and the Sword of Orion. And so on the right-hand side, you've got a little uh, image there uh, of uh, Orion. And uh, that's one of the probably most popular deep sky objects in, in, in the sky. Uh, and You'll, uh, and by the way, this, this uh, 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 phrase, deep sky object, is just simply a, a phrase we use to describe objects that are really far away from us uh, and that are beyond our solar system. They're not in our solar system. They're beyond out there in the galaxy or even beyond our Milky Way galaxy. And those are collectively just simply... Um, are just simply uh, referred to as deep sky objects. Um, there's a question here in the, the chat from Marek and he wants to know about the colors. And now I was just gonna mention that, you know, in, our, in a, a lot of those astronomy books and certainly online, you see these really spectacular images from the Hubble Space Telescope. In fact, the one on the left here is the uh, famous pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula, uh, which is a beautiful Hubble Space Telescope image. And uh, all of these uh, images are very colorful, these images of nebulas. The cameras really pick up the colors that are uh, put out by gases like hydrogen and oxygen and other gases here. And those are very colorful, but that's not what you see with the eye. You know, our, and I think uh, Mary Lou kind of alluded to that just a little a moment ago, uh, our color vision is really not that good. Uh, especially in low light level conditions, our, our eyes are very poor at uh, rendering color. Uh, and so that's a, a problem. Uh, when we look at these objects with a telescope, you don't generally see the colors. Uh, you'll see sort of this greenish, uh, sort of whitish greenish kind of color to most uh, of these mm -hmm. nebulas. Uh, so they don't, you do not see the color with, uh, with your eyes, but the cameras are very sensitive to some of these colors, especially the red, and those show up really quite nicely in photographs. Okay, let's move on. Uh, planetary nebulas. Uh, these are little knots of gas that are visible in different parts of the sky. And uh, planetary nebula is kind of a misnomer. They don't really have anything to do with planets. They're uh, basically uh, dead stars. Uh, they're stars that have run out of fuel. They've puffed off their outer layers and they've, they've passed on and uh, they've left behind these big shells of gas that, that appear uh, as these planetary nebula. And so... Um, 
I don't seem to recall which which nebula is this, Mark. Do you remember? That's the helix. Oh, that is the helix. I was going to say it looked kind yeah. of like the helix. Uh, so this is the helix uh, nebula, and so uh, this is the future of our solar system. Our sun, when it reaches the end of its life in say about four and a half billion years. Uh, will become a nebula like this. It will not explode in a supernova. It will go out with kind of a whimper. It'll go out the bang, goes out with a whimper, kind of sheds its outer layers and becomes these planetary nebula, which we can see in the nighttime of sky with our telescopes. Okay, let's uh, move on. Uh, we also can see, speaking of supernova, some of those stars are really, really big and they do go boom at the end of their life and leave, those supernova leave behind remnants, these big clouds of gas. And so on the left, uh, you have the famous Crab Nebula in the constellation Taurus, which is visible right now. And you have this little knot of gas that was left behind uh, by a star that blew up. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the year. I think it was 1054, 1054 yeah. AD. Uh, Certainly, we know that uh, Native Americans in the Southwest looked up in the night sky and saw this star, extra star in the constellation Taurus, and they noticed it, and they drew a little glyph of it on a rock. And so we, and other people, I think the Chinese also saw it as well. And so uh, people around the world uh, saw a new star for very briefly. And uh, so this is what we see uh, when we point our telescopes at this uh, area of the sky. We see the cloud, the debris cloud left behind by that explosion of a star. And so you can look for those supernova remnants, and you can even look for supernovas that are happening right now. And so, for example, here's a picture of the galaxy M82 uh, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, this is a, a supernova that appeared in 2014, not too long, about six years ago, uh, this appeared in the inside this galaxy. And so you can look for um, supernovas happening in nearby galaxies as well. Okay, let's uh, move on. Uh, globular clusters are really nice objects, especially for beginners, because they're big and they're most of them are fairly bright. You know, things like this, uh, I assume is M13 uh, in the constellation Hercules, a nice summertime object. Uh, you've got these beautiful globular clusters. You can see why them, we call them globular. They're kind of these big round balls of stars and uh, very nice to, to look at these clusters. Uh, these clusters are kind of far out uh, from the center of our galaxy. They orbit, they're kind of like satellites around our galaxy. You got these big globes of stars, sometimes hundreds of thousands of stars in these globes. Uh, very, very old, they've been around for billions and billions of years orbiting around our galaxy. So those are fun to look for as well. Uh, we've got a, a one in the sky right now. Uh, well. It's getting tough to see M15, isn't it, Mark? It's getting kind of it's low. setting, yeah. At this point, it's setting, so we're losing our view of M15. But M13 will be back in the, the late spring and early summer. Okay, let's uh, move on. We'll have M3. Uh, oh, that's right, M3. You're right. Yes, M3 yeah. is another nice uh, uh, globular cluster. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, you'll see, you know, you'll hear a lot of letters thrown around in, in astronomy. Uh, we'll, we'll refer to objects uh, M31 or uh, M57 and that sort of thing, or you might hear an NGC number, NGC 1456 or whatever. Uh, those are all catalogs uh, of, ob of deep sky objects that have been created over the years. The most popular is the Messier catalog. Uh, a, a uh, 18th century French astronomer, Charles Messier, uh, made a catalog of objects he was looking, uh, he was looking in the sky, looking for comets, and he found these objects and he made a list. And so that became the Messier catalog. So anything, anything you see with an M before it, for it, M31 is part of the Messier catalog, number 31 in that catalog. And so uh, speaking of M31, uh, galaxies are visible in uh, relatively modest size uh, telescopes. And so that's something you can look for. There's so billions in stars in these galaxies and uh, they are uh, visible in the nighttime sky. And so let's go forward to, um, here's another example of a, a planetary nebula, a famous one uh, in the constellation Lyra in the summer. Uh, sky. And so this is the ring nebula. You can see why we call it that, this ring of gas that's located at the bottom of the constellation of uh, Lyra, the little constellation of Lyra. And so there's a beautiful uh, uh, nebula. And right there at the center is the, the remnant, uh, the sort of ash left over of that star. There's a white dwarf uh, down in the center, uh, which is all that's left of the star that created the nebula. 
Okay, let's go on. And speaking of uh, uh, galaxies, uh, M31 is still in the sky now. Uh, and this is one of the closer big galaxies uh, to us. It's not the closest galaxy we know of, but it's uh, the closest big one. And it's uh, really easy to see. Uh, it's uh, very easily uh, visible in binoculars. Uh, if you do have dark skies, you can see with the naked eye if you know where to look, but uh, binoculars really helps in most areas. And uh, uh, so uh, there is uh, Andromeda. It's really big. It's, uh, in fact, in, in some telescopes, uh, it's hard to see the whole thing because your focal length might be a little too long uh, to see the whole thing. So it's nice to look at binoculars and then zoom in with a, with a telescope and look for some nice details there. It's a spiral galaxy similar to our Milky Way. So if you ever wondered what the Milky Way looks like from the outside, just look at a light at Andromeda there. And so uh, you'll see that in the constellation of Andromeda. And uh, uh, speaking of star clusters, we have different types of star clusters. Uh, not only do we have globular star clusters, but we have what are called open star clusters. And these are, part of our Milky Way galaxy and uh, their stars generally they've been born together and there's just these open scattered clusters of stars. The most famous example is M45, another Messier object otherwise known as the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters, the famous Seven Sisters located in Taurus. It's kind of, it's, they kind of sit on the shoulder of Taurus the bull and uh, really quite easy to see. Um, uh, I, I don't have great eyesight. I do see them as a kind of fuzzy spot uh, on the shoulder of Taurus, but people who have better eyesight can see four or five or six stars in, in, the, in, the, in the cluster. And so these are, uh, if I remember correctly, about uh, 400 or so light years away and perhaps 100 million years old or so. And so they're relatively young a cluster of stars and they're really beautiful to look at. And in fact, actually, uh, again, similar to uh, uh, M31, the Andromeda galaxy, uh, uh, telescopes often don't do this uh, cluster justice because their field of view is too small. And so the best way I find to, to view the Pleiades is with a pair of binoculars. So you get a beautiful view of the whole cluster all at once and it really looks pretty. Okay, let's uh, move on. Orion Nebula, we mentioned uh, earlier, that's located in the sword, the, actually the center star. If you look at the three stars in the belt, look at the three stars down below the belt, and the middle star there is where you'll find uh, this beautiful uh, collection of, of gas. And so, yeah, there's the sword, and you've got the Orion Nebula right in the middle of it, and that's visible binoculars. You get a little bit better view in a telescope though. And you've got uh, three different views of Orion here uh, in the upper part. That's uh, I guess a somewhat light polluted view of uh, Orion in a small telescope or a small or binoculars even. Uh, right. You can see some details to it. You can see that it has a shape. Uh, but if you have a little bit darker skies, a little bit larger telescope, you'll see a, a little bit better view. Jenny Jump. Uh, you have like a Jenny Jump and- This is Jenny uh, Jump. Uh, at the center of that uh, uh, nebula is the trapezium for stars uh, that uh, are there at the heart of the nebula. And uh, so you can look for those. Uh, if you're under really, really dark skies, if you're really far away and really ideal conditions, you can see uh, under a tremendous amount of detail. And uh, so you see all these striations in the, uh, inside the nebula down towards the center. And so it's really nice. Um, Merrick uh, asked the question, is the picture on the right from an eight inch telescope? Do you remember Mark, what size telescope that um, um, So what I, I um, equated that to a, a six or eight inch telescope in Montclair right. uh, without a filter, without a nebula filter. Okay. So what, you know, your common size telescope under, you know, heavily light polluted, you know, like a white zone mm -hmm. or, or you know, inner city sky, uh, you you would get that kind of view. But if you you venture out to even Sussex County or even uh, you know Warren County, you know the same telescope will give you this view here. You know, I was out uh, last night looking at the Orion Nebula with with my eight inch Dobsonian behind me here, and uh, it was very similar to this picture right here yeah. that we're looking at right here on okay. the right hand side. Good, good. Okay. Uh, well, uh, 
I think we're going to have a finish here with just an overview of the uh, Jan, excuse me, January night sky. You know, this is uh, set up uh, for uh, around eight o'clock, if I remember correctly, uh, for uh, uh, for early January, for the first half of January. Uh, if you're looking at about eight o'clock, well, you can see that Orion has risen up pretty high up in the sky here. And so that's where you'll find Orion, the Orion Nebula. Uh, if you look uh, up and to the right, you've got Taurus there. And the, you know, the Crab Nebula is right at the tip of the horn of, uh, of uh, Taurus there. And of course, in Taurus is the Pleiades, uh, the Seven Sisters uh, is high up in the southern sky right there. Yeah. And then uh, M31, you can see, is moving off to the western half of the sky. So if you face west and look up high, you'll see uh, M31, uh, the Andromeda galaxy, this little smudge, in, oval smudge uh, in the sky. And so, uh, by the way, when you're looking at a chart like this, if you're using it outside, uh, remember to put the direction that you're facing at the bottom of the chart. So if you're facing south, you hold it like this. But if you're facing towards the, uh, the west, uh, the look, let's say for Andromeda, you want to turn the map on its side so that west is down. And if you're facing north, well, then you want to turn it upside down so that it, or it matches the sky that you're looking at. Uh, and of course, uh, these uh, types of things, these types of maps you can, you can use, but you can also use an app. A lot of people to use, use apps like Starwalk. Uh, there are quite a, quite a uh, large number of different types of apps that you can use to help you uh, orient yourself uh, here in the nighttime sky, and those can really help. Uh, Solarium is another one. I don't know if there's any other ones that uh, some of the members want to mention, but Solarium, uh, Starwalk are, are good, good apps for this sort of thing. Okay, well, um, I try to remember Mark is, uh, oh, we wanted to finish with uh, just a reminder uh, about uh, reading material. The Night Watch is a, a great book. It's really one of the best, uh, uh, even though it's been around for a long time and it's uh, perhaps a lot of date, it's really one of the best night sky books uh, to start with, I think. Uh, night Watch by Terrence Dickinson. Um, the Beginner's Guide of uh, Observing Guide, I'm not really familiar with. Uh, Mark has recommended that. Uh, another one uh, that I mentioned in the chat was uh, Turn Left at Orion. Turn yeah. Left at Orion is a good That's one. That's another to, good one, yeah. To help you find your way uh, around the sky. And so uh, I think that was the last slide, Mark, I believe. That is, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, that, I believe, uh, brings us to the end of our presentation for tonight. And so we hope that you found this uh, valuable. We hope that you learned a little bit about the sky and about telescopes. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions about that, uh, you can contact the club. You can uh, take a look at some of the information we have on our Facebook page uh, and that sort of thing. And so uh, we hope that that was, uh, that was helpful to you. Uh, Mary Lou, did you have another uh, comment? Yeah, well, I just wanted to tell people to save February 10th, which is the second Wednesday in February for our next meeting. Uh, oh, yes. Jeremy Carlo from right. Villanova in Philadelphia is going to talk to us about the wacky world of quantum mechanics. Oh, yeah. How strange physics uh, plays into the Big Bang at the beginning of the universe. So, oh, boy. Cool. Yeah, that's a, a, a wild topic <laughs> for, yeah, so we'll for February. You know, he's, yeah. a, he's a yeah. physicist. Right, right. But so amateur great. Amateur astronomer great. as well. So. Cool, so we look cool. forward to that. Yeah, see next, yeah. See you next month. Yeah, thanks for for uh, for vi visiting us tonight. Uh, for our uh, NJG members, uh, please stick ar stick around. We have uh, some uh, short business to take care of, well, which we'll we'll do quickly. Uh, but uh, thanks for being with us, and uh, uh, come back and visit us 